This is a Stock Train Reality Podcast, episode 126. This is the Stock Trading Reality Podcast, where you get to see the realistic side of a trader's journey. Get inspired and stay motivated by everyday normal people who are currently on their journey to trading success. When he needs to eat humble pie, he goes water skiing. Play trader. Yeah, I don't know what my problem is. Um, I mean, I played sports growing up like a lot of sports in high school and all sorts of things. And in fifth grade or sixth grade, I was able to get up out of the water when I was water skiing. But I've tried two or three times since then and it has not gone well. I mean, I've almost gotten up, but I just, I don't know what my deal is. I have balance, but apparently not good enough. I must not have water coordination. I thought that land coordination and water coordination was kind of one and the same, but apparently not. So when it comes to uh, needing some humble pie. If I'm getting a little thinking too highly of myself, just slap some water skis on me, and I, uh, I I've learned it'll it'll drag me down to earth real quick. Uh, but Chez, uh, you grew up around the, the lakes and stuff. Do you have any water skiing uh, experience, or really any water sports experience? And can you actually get up out of the water? Yeah, so my uncle actually has a boat, and we used to go up to Missouri a lot, and I learned how to kneeboard, to water ski, and to wakeboard when I was probably uh, probably 10 or 11 years old, so I totally got that down, absolutely fine. It did take me a couple tries to kind of get up on the water skis, but honestly, once you're up, it's really not that hard. Um, but then remember, I've also skied and snowboarded all my life too, so I don't know if that helps any, um, but getting out of the water, that's kind of a, an interesting uh, there, there's a little bit of math involved in the angles and stuff you kind of have to hold and not get, you know, completely destroyed by the water. But yep, I'm, I'm totally able to kind of get out of the water. It's been a couple of years, but, uh, I am able to do it. So your confidence level is high then, huh? Yep. Yeah. You won't make a fool of me if, uh, you throw me out the back of a boat and strap some skis on me. But now I know how to give you a dish of humble pie if, uh, we ever are on a boat for some reason. That, that is true. That is true. And actually, as you saw, I'm assuming by the title of this podcast, we have uh, the show producer, IT Nate, he goes by in the community, and he's been hanging out with us this whole time. And I know he's a little wakeboarder nutcase. Half the time, Chuz and I are trying to do stuff, and he's out wakeboarding on the job. So, uh, Nate, is wakeboarding, is that your specialty? Uh, I don't know about specialty. I know how to do it, if that's what you're saying. I can get up on the wakeboard. Can you do, like, fancy tricks and stuff? <laughs> I cannot do any fancy tricks, no. I'm happy when I don't face plant. How often do you go wakeboarding? Uh, once or twice a year, maybe. When well, I didn't that's, say that's outside of work, you go, said, you go once or twice a, <laughs> a week at least. <laughs> yeah, right, once or yes, twice a year yeah. outside once of. Uh, I'm wakeboarding right now. That would not surprise me. So again, I'm assuming you did see the title of this, and uh, this is going to be one of our technology podcasts, looking through the history of things. Uh, it Nate, again, show producer. He was a guest on episode. Three, and it's been a long time since episode three. So we figured, you know what? Why not bring them back and kind of talk some technology tech, talk some computer stuff. And uh, just recently, I got a new trading computer and he built it for me. So I thought, you know what? Why don't we just go through um, kind of what you chose, why you chose it. And Chez, is a, he's really you know in the loop as far as this technology stuff goes. So I mean, he'll be able to chime in, I'm sure, on alternatives and maybe what he uses or what his personal preferences would be. Uh, but that's kind of just the drift of this. So if you're maybe in the market for a new uh, trading computer or just kind of uh, are thinking about it, but maybe you're hung up on you know one attribute or another, then ideally this uh, show, this interview here will kind of, not really an interview, more so just a discussion, uh, will be able to help you out and uh, you know, it's we'll put the links and stuff to all these things in the show notes. But the one thing that I quickly learned, uh, Nate did a video on this where he shows himself building this. Is you techies out there? It's a pretty cutthroat community. Uh, reading through YouTube comments, it's like, geez, chill out, people. I thought the you know the tinfoil hot hats and the penny stock market were crazy. You look at some of these techies and. You would think Nate built me an atomic bomb or something like that. What's half the people are freaking out about this or freaking out about that. So uh, point of that is full disclosure, disclosure just like trading, um, correct, and you two can both correct me if I'm wrong. This is what I'll bring you in. But there's no 
like holy grail system, right? There's no exact science to how these things can be built. Is that right, Nate, Chez? You're totally right. It's all personal preference. I mean, it's it's kind of like trading as well in the same sense that um, there's so many different routes and options you can take that are going to achieve the same thing, you know, a, a good working computer. So, yes, more more often than not, it's just like any other kind of hobbyist type thing. Um, some people are super adamant about super brands and hate on other brands. But, yeah, for the most part, they're all going to generally do the same stuff. And it kind of reminded me, uh, I think yesterday, Chez, or a couple of days ago in the chat room, I don't know, somebody was asking about something and you just you just you didn't unleash on them but you gave them some tough love you're like listen you could have the best this that and the other but that doesn't mean you're going to be a better trader like at the end of the day uh oh fees i think somebody was asking about uh, commissions and fees and you're like listen whether you're paying a penny or a dollar or ten dollars at the end of the day when all the dust is settled you just got to know how to trade so same concept here i mean you could have the best you know trading rig ever but if you don't know how to trade, then maybe all the trading rig ensures is that you just lose money quicker than what you were if your system was a little slower and it, it, it took a while. So um, I, I thought that was kind of good timing with all that. When you had, uh, do you remember? Do you know what conversation I'm talking about, Chez? Do you remember that from like yesterday or something? Yeah, absolutely. And that's because, and I remember when I was brand new to the markets as well. I thought the real recipe for success is kind of the tools you have. And I'm not saying that you know that's that's you know not important but it definitely isn't as important as some people think you know i get messages all the time you know i'm going to buy 3 4k monitors and i can watch 32 stocks at a time and i go well you know i know somebody who traded on a laptop with thinkorswim with their regular retail rates and still made a million bucks um, obviously as they've gotten bigger over time they realize they could save a lot of money in fees and commissions by going elsewhere but the thing is it just comes down to can are you able to trade or not? You know, don't get me wrong. If you have the fastest computer, the best monitors, um, the the fastest broker, it's not going to really matter if you don't know what you're doing. So some people just get really hung up on kind of the tech side, um, and I think that's more of a society thing in the terms of oh, if I spend more money on this, it's going to make me better at it. Um, it's just not the case, especially with trading. There's plenty of people who do just fine on a single screen, one monitor, old you know computer from 2005. Um, so granted, whatever kind of computer you build, obviously it just needs to run your stuff well. But um, <laughs> trading, trading is a whole different ball game. Yeah, and I, I like what you said about people think like you just have to spend a bunch of money. And I, th I think a lot of that comes from, you know, the saying, you know, it takes money to make money. And that is true, it takes money to make money, but in my opinion, spend the money in your trading account. Spend it to learn. You don't have to pour it all into the actual computer setup because if you, sp if you spend your entire budget on the computer, okay, well now I have this thing and I don't know, not only do I not know how to trade, I don't even have any money to trade anymore. So um, it takes money to make money, you know, take that within context of things. It doesn't mean that you have to go and, like Chez beautifully said, buy the best of the best technology. As long as you're not on dial-up internet and a computer from like 1997, you should be good to go. So, um, Nate, yes, you are going to be part of this podcast. I'm sure you're starting to get offended by. Uh, He's wakeboarding. Not... <laughs> I've got up and left like I usually do while you guys podcast. Is that not how it's supposed to happen? I'm supposed to stay here the whole time. We hear the waves in the background. <laughs> So, all right, Nate, well, I, I'm, I'll kind of th throw this over um, almost to you and Chez, and I'll kind of just play the, because I am, uh, full disclosure, I mean, I'm not like a total moron when it comes to tech. Chez and Nate would probably disagree with that, but I know a little bit, but this is definitely not my bread and butter. So, um, I mean, Chez, you definitely hop in whenever, uh, but Nate, we'll let you kind of start wherever you want. What was the, the first, where did you start when you're building, you know, my trading computer now that I have from scratch? Where did you start? Uh, was there a reason that you started there or is it not really? Pretty? So from me asking you guys this, and this is to both of you, because and this is, I have no idea. Is there a logical place to start when it comes to building a computer or can you really kind of just start from wherever? I guess, Nate, you can take it and then Chez, you can definitely chime in too. Uh, I guess when I start, uh, I always start with a processor that kind of sets the platform for what you're going to need, what kind of motherboard you're going to need, um, all that other type of stuff. So the processor is usually the place that I start. Um, and just you build off of there. Once you pick your processor, you can pick all of your other components and, and start assembling it. And I want to fully agree. Most of the time, um, most of my research, and I'm going to do a new build, and I don't do them that often, 
Um, starts exactly like Nate said with the processor because uh, from there pretty much you have to pick your motherboard and all your components and things that'll work well with it. Um, but the processor generally is the one that's kind of like the brains of the computer. It's pretty much going to determine um, how fast it can operate and there's more things that go into it but it's it's the real core of your computer so when you start there usually you just kind of build the components off of that and you know um, a lot of sites are great today uh, they weren't they weren't always this way but they tell you if things are compatible or not so um, it makes shopping and kind of building computers yourself now a lot easier than it used to be so is you pick the processor now how do you know what processor to pick Nate so for you for, why don't I have no idea what one did you even get and then you know why did you choose the one that you did all right, so the one that we chose was the Intel Core i7 7700K. Uh, at the time that we bought all this stuff, that was like the latest generation of processor from Intel. Uh, since we've built, bought it and built it and everything, they've actually come out with newer versions of it, but that's the one we you went with. You just built it like three weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, that's well, they technology. came out with newer stuff. <laughs> you build it now and there'll be something else that comes out in three weeks from now, so it's just how it rolls. And you and you is that like the fastest of the fastest out there, or why did you choose that one as opposed to you know an, an, another version of it or another? Yeah, brand it's not or the fastest or the fastest for sure. Um, I feel like it's a good price point to performance type of mix. Um, so you can obviously spend like a thousand dollars on a processor if you wanted to, um, but you're not going to get that much more performance over spending three or four hundred dollars on a processor. This one we bought was three hundred nine dollars or something like that. Um, and the way I kind of judge a lot of that, or you kind of get a good idea, and I'm actually sitting here talking with my hands and you guys can't see me, but uh, I go to passmark.com. Uh, they do a lot of CPU benchmarking. Um, they can kind of give you an idea of how your processor is going to perform versus other processors. So that's a good place to start if you kind of have a budget or idea and you want to know what your sweet spot's going to be. So and, how fat... Uh, I, oh, I just want to weigh in here. Yeah. Um, so pretty much exactly what Nate said in the terms of it's pretty much price to performance. Um, like you said, you know, you can buy a thousand dollar processor. In my opinion, those are more um, what I call kind of hobbyist builds. There are people who want extreme overclocking and um, pretty much want to. Uh, that's like their passion. That's where they spend their money. That's their hobby. So for them, they always kind of go big. Um, but for just a, a little bit less performance, and I mean, you can save 66%, um, that CPU that Nate got you is absolutely fantastic. So I'm on an older generation than that. But um, as far as kind of benchmarking and stuff, it's pretty cool to see. I do a lot of that when I'm interested in buying video cards. Um, there might be a video card that's $1,000 that only performs like 4% better than a card that costs half the price. So um, pretty much price to performance. You're trying to find that sweet spot. I'm sure Nate could have built you a $5,000 computer that's totally awesome. Um, but like like all technology, three weeks later, something new is going to come out anyway. So is it really worth it to pretty much buy the top of the top? And while so he's using it, wrong, he would but, never uh, notice the difference. It, it performed like you'd never even notice using it if they were between the $400 and the $4,000 one. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask is uh, from the, the amateur listening in, which I found fascinating, it sounds like when you're building a computer, there's a high risk of you paying a lot more for something for maybe like four or five or maybe even just 10% better performance. Is, am I understanding that right? That is a pretty big risk if you're kind of just out there doing things ignorantly. Yeah, that'd be pretty easy to do. It'd be pretty easy to drop five or $600 on a processor and not need anything close to that for sure. Or just you get a little bit more, but the the quote unquote little bit more is only like maybe five ten percent better operating performance that you spent you know three hundred dollars more for. It's it sounds like that's uh I mean, is that what I'm gathering is there's a lot of stuff out there. So these sites that you guys listed off make a lot of that kind of easy to avoid. Yeah, yeah, they give you a real world interpretation of how it's actually going to perform versus other ones. Okay, so what would you guys say is the the, the minimum? like speed for a processor that's, for somebody on a budget, what's probably the bare minimum they would wanna get speed wise in order to handle um, you know, trading, email, you know, and just kind of the, the basic stuff. Out. So not like some hardcore gamer or anything. Uh, given that the processor is like the hardest part to upgrade down the road, I would spend a little bit more on this part than the other ones um, off the bat. And because of that, I would say start with a Core i7. You can get anything in the Core i7 line, even if it's a generation or two old. Um, but I would say anything in the Core i7 range would be fine if you stick with Intel. Um, now, AMD, AMD just came out with their Ryzen, how do you pronounce that, processors. Um, and I those seem to perform pretty good, but I've never actually used one of those. So I don't know, Ches, if you have some experience with those or not. 
Yeah, so I'll, I'll weigh in. So I actually used to, so AMD, as far as the things they build, um, it's a different pretty much processor. Um, they do, you know, they do try to keep up pretty much apples for apples compared to Intel. Uh, I've only used an AMD um, processor and an AMD graphics card once in my life. I do find that I've always had better performance, less issues going Intel. And then, like I said, this is just probably the hobbyist side in me where I really like um, Intel a lot more than I like AMD. Same for video cards as well. I just feel like they have better support, better updates, um, and kind of keep things running. It seems like they spend more money in terms of kind of keeping what you have relevant and keeping it working, you know, smoothly than uh, AMD products. But no, I actually have no. Um, when I did work at Newegg, we did do some benchmarking on AMD processors. Um, but I was just going to actually bring that up too. Um, you can get suitable performance for less of a cost but like i said you know like nate said um upgrading these things down the line you're pretty much gonna have to almost do an entirely new build um if you change your processor so i would totally agree that um if the one thing you want to kind of make last the longest you're going to spend a little bit more for i would say definitely um an i7 uh intel all right cool that that's very beneficial so Processor is basically the groundwork, the foundation. So you might as well get a bigger foundation than what you may think you need before things get out or, you know, because if you have to replace that, basically you have to replace an entire house. So get a good yeah. solid foundation. Yeah, you can always add more RAM or a bigger hard drive or a better video card down the road, but you can't really add a faster processor. It just doesn't really work out very good. So the processor is the foundation and then RAM, memory, that's like Windows, maybe something else is like uh, a nice little hot tub. You can always upgrade those things, right? But the foundation it is what it is. Exactly. Do you get the analogy that I'm using, Nate? Yeah, I like it. I like it a lot. Good, good. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. I, Ches and I are here to please and we, we want to make your life as easy as possible. So, all right, you got the, we got the processor in place. We've established along with our analogy that that is the foundation of our house. So what is what was the next thing you looked at, Nate, um, and why? Or you know, if there wasn't a reason, then whatever. But let's what's the next piece of hardware we're going to take a look at? So the next thing you need is the uh, the motherboard, and that's what actually all the components connect to. So the processor connects to this, the RAM connects to it, the hard drive, all that stuff connects to the motherboard itself. Uh, there's a couple things you need to look at when you're buying the motherboard. First, since you already have your processor picked out, you need to know what socket type you need. In this case, it was a socket LGA 1151, and that's the socket type that the processor processor actually uses to connect to the motherboard with. So that's kind of where you got to start. Um, you got to just narrow it down to all the motherboards that have that socket type on them. Um, and from there, you need to figure out, A, how many video cards you want to have, and then B, how big you want your case to be. Um, pretty much all the machines that I build are micro ATX size just because we don't need a lot of expansion cards. Um, but there's different sizes in motherboards that you can choose, and they'll give you more slots to connect more cards if you need to. All right, I have a question. I, I feel like the reverse engineering didn't go far enough because you said, well, first you need to know how many video cards you, you want. But <laughs> yep. isn't the true question there, how many monitors do I want? Because when you know how many monitors you want, isn't that going to tell you how many video cards you're going to want, which then leads you to the motherboard? Or am I overthinking this? No, you're correct. Those go hand in hand. Um, you can get video cards that support one or two monitors or ones that support four monitors. So it kind of depends on what type of video card you end up using as well. But yeah, I would say you kind of got to know how many monitors you want to use. If you only want to use one monitor, well, then you don't even need a video card. Just use the built-in and you're good to go. But if you want to run four, then yeah, you should probably look and see what video cards are out there and how you want to run those. So in shopping for the motherboard, one of the questions you need to know is how many monitors do you want before you go shopping for a motherboard? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's pretty accurate. I usually buy a motherboard that's got two video card slots on it just to be safe. And that's kind of how a lot of them come at this point anyway. So that's not super crucial that you know that now, but you should at least have an idea of how many you want now or down the road, how many you might want to run. Perfect. That that makes that sense. Now, which, which one did you ultimately choose? And again, just... All this will be linked on the show notes page, so don't think like you have to, you know, be writing all this down as you're driving or running on the treadmill. But uh, which one did you choose? And then Chez, um, if you have any thoughts on motherboards, definitely chime in. Yeah, so I'm going to tell you the model number, but these things change so quick that by the time you actually listen to this podcast, this motherboard may totally be discontinued. But uh, it's the MSI Arsenal Intel Z270M motherboard, and it's a micro ATX, like I said, and it's got room for two video slots and then also able to support our processor that we chose. 
And, you know, just to, to chime in off of uh, what Nate said, for the most part, unless you're kind of building a crazy gaming rig or some crazy hobbyist build, um, those micro ATX boards are totally suitable for what you're doing. They're a much smaller form factor, too, um, in the sense that they don't take a lot of space as far as having a huge case. So I actually have a, a full ATX build. Um, I've always kind of been into computers and technology since I was a kid. So I have like four video card slots and things like that. And while I've never used more than three, um, those are good things to kind of keep in mind. And, uh, you know, pretty much what Nate was saying and you got, you brought up as well, Clay, is, um, you know, somebody who's using two monitors versus somebody who wants to build an eight monitor array, um, those are really the only times you're going to need to look at um, kind of more specialized video cards, whether you need to have more cards in general or a card that supports more. So you could buy, like Nate was saying, a card that supports two monitors, no problem. But if you want an eight monitor build, you're probably going to shell out more for those video cards and get ones that, you know, get two cards that both support four each. Um, so those are just little things to kind of keep in mind. For the most part, though, you're going to be totally fine um, with any kind of run of the mill um, micro ATX ones. And MSI is a great, great brand. Gigabyte's a great ba- brand. Jeez, I can't even say the word brand. Um, but otherwise, I mean, you really can't go too wrong on it. You just got to know what, you know, like you're saying, Clay, almost a reverse engineering of what what do you want the end product to look like and just make sure you don't, you know, shoot yourself in the foot and don't have enough slots. If you need like expansion slots for a wireless card or anything like that, these are just kind of little things to keep in mind when uh, you're picking out your motherboard. And then yeah, on and- the uh, brand uh, thing that you're saying too, I would say between MSI Gigabit and ASUS, those are probably the only three that I would ever even think about buying. How about you, Chez? Do you do you, do you go outside of that realm of those three brands at all, or are those what you? No, stick- no, I, I stick with those absolutely. For the most part, I'm uh, a Gigabyte and MSI guy, but ASUS has really kind of stepped up their game in the the past year. So yeah, I I totally on board with those three brands, but I never really look at. There's some other kind of bargain box type brands, but honestly, um, kind of like what I was saying with Intel versus AMD before, I just find there's much more support, much more help. And, um, you know, it, in my opinion, they have the money to really kind of test these things and make sure they work well versus kind of a smaller company. Um, they might produce something that is technically the same on paper, um, but they're a much smaller shop. You know, if you got a uh, RMA something or send something back because it stops working, you're going to have a more difficult time with a smaller brand than, um, you know, one that's big and has kind of established itself. What is RMA? Um, it's pretty much returning merchandise. Sometimes motherboards will come what's called DOA, dead on arrival. Um, these are like very, very, all these electronic stuff are very finicky to, you know, um, shocks and, you know, uh, bumps and stuff. So in shipping, um, sometimes devices will come and not work. And some companies are a lot easier. They understand that this is just a problem. You know, you'll send it back and they'll go into their factory and pretty much figure out what the problem is, fix it and then resell it. Um, but other companies I've heard of real big horror stories where, you know, they send a motherboard back to either get repaired or replaced and they don't get anything back for like 30 days or something. So that's pretty much 30 days you don't have a computer. Um, Whereas Gigabyte and those guys, you can pretty much send them back. And once they have shipping confirmation that you sent yours, they'll send you one right away, you know, with a two day delivery or something. So you can kind of get back up and running. But um, I think that's just a safer bet. It's almost like almost anything in life. The, The bigger type companies and brands are, they understand that they need to be good with support or people will shop elsewhere. So yeah, Gigabyte, um, Asus, and MSI. Um, I've I've had good experiences with all three of those. You know, and I never thought about that. So just you know, putting my strictly trading hat on. Yeah, I don't want to sit here with no computer for thirty days. But so that's a big difference, like you said, Ches. If, as soon as I get confirmation that you that you've mailed it, they'll they'll step stuff up. So if you go outside of the big brands, um, yeah, that would be a really crappy situation. So yeah, that would. Good. That, that's some good stuff there for our listeners. So, uh, yeah, stick with the big brand. And do the big brands usually have the most competitive pricing, or can you uh, get better pricing? Maybe if you go outside of the loop of you know, kind of the, the the big three brands that you guys are talking about, can you get better pricing, or do the big brands already have it to begin with? Um, honestly, I usually don't even look at the other brands now. I usually will just select the the brands that I like personally. But um, at the yeah, same time, I totally agree. Yeah, they're for the most part they're competitive between the two. Most of the time, you know, more often than not, the prices are so close. Um, what you're really paying for is you might prefer this one brand or this brand might have a feature um, based for your hard drives to make them faster and do SATA and stuff like that. And, and if you don't understand what that means, don't worry about it. Uh, but for the most part, they kind of realize that they're competing against each other. So the prices are pretty close from what I've seen in the past. I, I just like how both you're like, no, I don't even know. I don't even 
you stick with the, the, the those three brands, and it sounds like you don't even very or you don't even research outside of it. So I think that speaks volumes. That uh, um, yeah, it is what it is. Now I want to kind of you know talk a little trading here, and we were talking about because uh, when we motherboards, I, I can see people sitting there and driving, thinking, okay, well I gotta I gotta figure out how many monitors I'm going to use. And uh, well, you know, I saw this picture on Instagram, and this guy had like nine monitors and all sorts of stuff. So um, you know, Ches. Weigh in, what are your thoughts on, we've talked about this before, but I mean, there's no better place to talk about what is the right amount of monitors to use for trading. Uh, I mean, you give your thoughts and then I'll give mine. So when it comes to, you know, real estate, screen real estate, you know, what are your thoughts on the on the topic? Yeah, so the biggest game changer for me in terms of productivity and stuff like that, and it, it makes sense now why most jobs and companies or if you work on a computer will actually give you two monitors. Um, I totally believe that at a minimum, um, especially for trading, I would say two monitors is probably ideal. Um, now, I know a lot of you have probably seen those crazy photos of people who have you know 26 monitors surrounding them and 4K TVs all around them and stuff like that. Here's what I want to remind you of. You have two eyes, and unless your eyes are splitting and looking in different directions, you can really only focus on one thing at a time. Don't get me wrong, if you have four charts up on one screen, it's nice to take a quick glance and you can kind of see all the information, say you want, whether you have one is the the S&P, so you're watching the overall market, and then you have three other tickers that you know, you're know you thinking of putting trades on. Um, then on your other monitor, you probably have all your execution, uh, maybe your options chain, things like that. So in, in my opinion, I think two monitors is really all you need. Um, I, I'm going to be a hypocrite here because not only do I have two monitors, I have a 4K TV. Um, but you got to remember, most of the real estate I'm using for the 4K um, is some light charting. There's four charts on there, but most of it is just I have you know Twitter up, I have our work email, our work calendar, um, our customer support stuff. So for me, that just makes my life easier. And I actually bought the TV to double as um, this is pretty much my office doubles as a guest room when people come in. Um, you know, they can flip on Netflix and actually use the television as a television when they're here visiting. So um, by no means do I think you need, I have the equivalent of six monitors. Um, remember, most of that stuff is more productivity related for me for doing kind of work and stuff, not specifically trading. For trading, I don't ever use more than two monitors and I think that's totally enough. And if you wanna build a crazy big array, um, good for you, but I, in my opinion, I don't think you're gonna find as much value in it um, as you might think. Six, six monitors will not make you a better trader than somebody who actually knows how to trade well on on, you know, a laptop screen. So just got to kind of keep those things in mind. This is this is the same avenue of, you know, spending more won't make you better per se. Yeah, no, and that's, I fully agree there. I would say, I mean, there's no holy grail, so we'll stick to that. But if you want to, you know, if you hate tabs, if you hate a million windows everywhere, then yeah, two monitors, I mean, you truly can't go wrong there, especially if you do have a, a job outside of it. I mean, you can have email up on one monitor, uh, so I would say definitely two is, uh, is is a good sweet spot, but you know, Chess continues to nail it. If you don't know what you're doing, it doesn't matter anyways. I mean, because somebody that does know what they're doing can make, you know, a, a tablet work or can make a laptop work or, you know, you know whatever. But I, uh, I use four and, but kind of like Chess, uh, two, yeah, two of them, maybe a little bit more than two are for trading. And then everything else is all just business related, work related, whatever you want to call it. So by no means is it, uh, you know, I use four, so therefore that's some sort of, well, um, you know, that, that, that Chess guy, he uses six, and then the, the Clay guy uses four, so let's split the difference. Okay, I need five, so my, it, it doesn't work like that. This is just, uh, you know, get a setup that works for you. If you can afford two, I would say start with two, um, but definitely start small. Maybe just start at one, but uh, I, there is no need to go out there and buy a motherboard that's gonna support 12 monitors because you have these you know, images of grandeur. Remember, you're just getting started. There's nothing wrong with shooting big, so don't get me wrong there, but I promise you the more you learn, the more efficient you become, and that's the great thing about efficiency is, well, I don't need to have all these monitors because I'm efficient with my system. You're gonna see that 12, eight, six, it, it, heck, four, not really needed. So um, now Nate will kind of go back to the tech side of things. Uh, I now have four new monitors. So which monitors did you uh, choose? And is there any reason why you chose what you did? I want to chime in on the multiple multiple monitor thing first. You I don't get a trade. Lot of what, do you, what do you know about this? You, <laughs> well, your retire, retirement investing is not trading. <laughs> 
I know, but I use one monitor when I trade. I know. Anyway, people email me a lot and they say, hey, I want to build a four monitor computer and I have like $800. Well, you're not even gonna be able to get four monitors for $800, let alone build a computer. I think a lot of people underestimate how much a decent monitor actually costs. I mean, you're probably two to $300 real easy to get a bottom of the line entry level monitor that's going to do what you want to do. So I think a budget is another big factor when it comes into doing this. If you only have 800 or a thousand dollars, you're not getting four monitors. It's just not going to happen. That's actually a really good point. So, and my foot doesn't taste too good. So I, yeah, I definitely put my foot in good point there. Nate. Just good go point. water skiing. Yeah. I well, need to go practice. <laughs> What what I want to bring up though too is you kind of nailed it, Clay. As 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 time has gone on, you'll start to find out. You know, you become more efficient not only with what you have, but you might be using, you know, say one monitor to start. Say you, most of your budget had to go into actually building the PC, and you have one monitor. Um, and now, as after you've been trading on it, you see, ooh, you know, I could really use some more screen real estate for, um, you know, maybe some more charts or some more uh, order entry, um, you know, anything in, related to that. Now you can start looking to spring and save up for a second monitor. Um, but that would just take a little bit of foresight and make sure, you know, most video cards nowadays at least support two. Most of them support three as a normal. Um, a lot of them nowadays even support four, no problem. Um, so pretty much, you know, if you have the foresight when you're building the PC to say, hey, I at least want to, you know, upgrade to two in the future, that's an upgrade you can easily do. Um, kind of tying back into the, the motherboard and CPU conversation, it's much more difficult to say upgrade that CPU than it is to literally plug in a second monitor. So you always have the ability to kind of add a monitor, um, but you know, you don't need to, you know, waste half your budget or a third of your budget on monitors right from the get go. You could seriously trade on one monitor if you needed to. I'm not going to tell you it's going to be the easiest, um, but honestly, especially if you're a newer trader, you probably shouldn't be focusing on more than one or two tickers total. Um, you're just not. It takes time to really be able to kind of multitask and watch a bunch of positions at the same time. So um, remember, that's a much easier upgrade to do than um, you know, pretty much starting out with eight and you've spent a thousand dollars on monitors right there. Chess, that's an excellent point. I didn't even think about that. But if you do start with just one monitor, by default, it's basically going to force you to watch one ticker at a time. But to Chess's point, that's what you should be doing anyway. So if there's any way to kind of pigeonhole yourself into doing something, watching one ticker at a time is definitely something that is good to pigeon your, pigeonhole yourself into doing, which one monitor uh, is going to do a good job of that. So if you can only start with one monitor, I never thought about that, Chess. That's actually a super good point. That's a great thing because you don't need to be, you know, looking this way, another way, all over the place when you're first getting started. You need to be laser focused on finding the one ticker, watching the one ticker, entering the one ticker, managing the one ticker. You don't need to be doing everything else. So Chez, man, you almost brought a tear to my eye. That was, that's a great point. So it's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. I want to focus on one. If I only have one monitor, then, then it's going to happen. So this is some good stuff, fellas. If, if we were all together, I'd be giving everybody a group hug right now. So... Um, but we'll move on. I don't want to get this too weird. So, um, oh, Chaz, I want to ask you, since you do a lot of stuff with customer service, <laughs> I didn't know. Do you get people that are like, so I have $500 for a budget and I want 16? I mean, do you get any crazy like tech requests like that? Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of the times they get, um, you know, Nate will see them too and have to kind of chime in. And we we obviously have a recommended builds and we have a couple articles regarding kind of PC builds for trading versus a mobile one versus a stationary one at home. Uh, but yeah, I have people who go, you know, I want to I want to build a six monitor array for 500 bucks. And I'm just kind of like, yeah, you know, that's without hardware even looking at it, you can't even afford, you know, you can maybe get two monitors total for the budget you have. So um, you kind of got to be diligent about it and you can't just and I'm not I mean sure I bet you could go to a garage sale and find some old CRT monitors those huge ones that are super deep and take up your entire desk um, but is that what you really want to be trading on no you want some flat screens um, you want them to kind of be not take up your entire desk uh, it's all about efficiency and honestly these are things remember if you cheap out in this realm and you buy some really crappy bottom bargain brand monitors you know the chances of those shorting out, dying, having a bunch of lines go across them and just being poor overall. Um, remember, this is something you're looking at to essentially make money while you're trading. Um, so I'm not saying you need to get the top of the line $1,500 monitors, uh, but at the same time, they, they're they not the cheapest. The cool thing is though, um, I still have monitors that I bought from 2000 and 
13, I think, and they still work absolutely fine. Um, but remember, that's almost like an expense. It's a it's a business expense you're going to have to shell out at first, um, but it's not something you're going to need to upgrade every single year. So if you do yourself a favor and get some good brands, reputable brands, you know, I have ViewSonic, I have an Asus monitor, um, and then my 4K is a television, so it's a Vizio. But, um, you know, those brands, I'm not worried about it dying on me immediately. They come with manufacturer's warranties, stuff like that. But, um, yeah, it's going to cost you a little bit. And like I said before, you can always pretty much add more monitors. So you don't need to start off going completely crazy and nutty like that. And um, honestly, when you're first trading, like we were just talking about, Focusing on one ticker and trading it well, that should be your objective. Because if you can do that, then sure, you can start to kind of sprinkle in a second, you know, monitor with a second ticker you might be trading. But yeah, you want to focus on doing what you're doing and doing it well. Well said, well said. So, Nate, uh, we now know what Chess has. What did you, uh, what monitors did you select for my build? And I just give us a detail, or I should say, give listeners the details of uh, the monitor situation. All right, so the monitors we picked, uh, they're Dell 4K 27-inch screens. Uh, the model number is P2715Q, uh, if you want to look them up. But um, they're pretty much just a standard workstation-style 4K monitor. There's nothing special about them, nothing flashy about them. Uh, they're just solid, well-built, and they're just basically going to run forever. So that's why we picked those. And I will say uh, the Dells that I we had, when, the last time you built was, what, 2013 or something? We were trying to do the the date, but I mean, those monitors still work perfectly fine. So um, I think it circles back to the whole big brand thing. As far as I'm concerned, Dell, they make a good monitor. And you know, the ones that we were using, we actually sold to some uh, friends that we have. So I mean, they're, they're good enough to be able to sell, uh, you know, and, and get some money back from them. So um, and those monitors are actually seven years old. I just checked on mine and they say 2010 on them that they're manufactured. So uh, they've been running around for a while and they're due just fine. I have three of them on my desk, too, and they work. They work beautifully. Very nice. Very nice. So, um, yeah, good, good monitor discussion. So where are we going to go next, Nate? We got uh, motherboard processor. We got monitors. Uh, we should probably talk video cards real quick. Would that make sense yeah, I guess here? Video cards probably make the most sense given where our discussion is going. So it's really, like we said, going to depend on how many monitors you want to do. If you just want one or two, you can probably run them right off the motherboard with the built-in ports and not have any problems at all. Uh, if you want to do more than that, then you might have to start looking at a video card and how you want to connect all of those. So the motherboard does have video outlets onto it already as a default. So uh, assuming that nobody wants to do anything crazy, I mean, nobody, you don't even have, you don't even have to shop elsewhere. That's going to come with a motherboard already. Yep, absolutely. You can just plug your monitor right into your motherboard and you're good to go. No need to buy another component or anything. Okay. Cause I always thought that it was, you'd have to buy, you know, the motherboard and then buy a video card for the motherboard. I didn't realize that there are by default, some video cards that actually came with it. So, um, do you have, what what brand are the video cards that you uh, put into this build? And then Chez, I'd, I'd like to know what brand you use because uh, it seems like these brands, uh, usually a safe bet to go with some of these, you know, uh, better brands um, that we've had success with. So uh, chime in after uh, Nate fills in the listeners. All right, so the brand we went with, I, there's kind of a twofold. There's a brand that actually makes the video card, and then there's a brand that makes the chip that goes on the motherboard. Uh, the chip manufacturer is NVIDIA, and I pretty much always go with those guys over AMD. Um, and then the manufacturer that actually made the board and put it all together is PNY. But I think in this case, PNY is the only one that makes this card. So we really didn't have a whole lot of option there. Yeah, and and what what video card specifically is it, Nate? Because I I am you're totally right that these PNY cards are almost like a specialty in their own sense. Is they're they're literally made for kind of workstations and productivity. What what's the actual name of the card? Yeah, it's a Quattro K twelve hundred, and it's got four Display Port outputs that shoot four K on all of them. And and that's the kind of big thing to remember too, because as we were kind of discussing, you know, um, if you have a 4K monitor versus a 1080p monitor, and remember, 4K is kind of a newer technology. Um, you, what it really means is that you can fit more things on your screen. Um, there's just more pixels. It's what we call kind of more screen real estate per monitor. Um, so 4K is equivalent of pretty much four 1080p monitors. And if I'm blowing your mind here, you don't need to even really worry about that. But it is something you're going to need to look at if you decide you're going to be buying 4K 
4K monitors, you need to have a video card that supports 4K monitors. Because um, not all video cards do that, especially if you're looking at kind of lower cost ones. But um, I, I'm totally going to echo Nate in the sense of I am an NVIDIA guy. I have a 980 Ti. Um, remember, my computer is more of a build for um, not only working, but I also do play some video games on it. So it's definitely able to, you know, it easily handles all the monitors I have. And um, its performance for kind of gaming specifically is good. But you don't need, you know, that PNY card is literally made for 4K workstations like that. So by no means you need to buy a kind of gaming grade video card uh, to handle charts in a trading platform. It, th those things are actually very, very minimal um, use on your system um, versus, you know, running a game at a very high frame rate and stuff like that. No, that's actually really good. I'm glad we kind of have uh, the dual build that we're talking about because yeah, there's a lot of people out there that enjoy gaming and gaming and trading kind of one and the same in the sense of the crowd it may draw. So um, if you are a gamer, then yeah, definitely be listening to what uh, Chez is saying. But I, I don't. I guess that brings up a question, Nate. Could my build? Could my? Could that? Could mine handle video games, or is is, is my rig a total piece of crap for video games? It could totally handle them, but you're not going to be able to run them at like their highest resolution or anything like that. It's just not designed for that. Yours is designed to be on all day, every day, and just be stable and not crash on you. Whereas like a more of a high end like gaming system is going to be designed to give you like breakneck speed at the sacrifice of possibly a little bit of performance or a little bit not performance but a little bit of stability. Like you're probably not going to be able to run a game at the full resolution resolution all day, every day because it's probably going to crash at some point. It's kind of like, uh, you know, for gaming specifically, it's almost like you need more of a sports car. If, say, you you do car racing on the weekends, you're going to need a sports car. You're not going to go to the track in your, you know, Camry and do that. Um, Clay, you're not taking your computers to the racetrack and you're not going to the racetrack. You just need something that literally is your daily driver. You want to work well and you want to handle everything you're doing. So that, that's Clay's just driving the cargo van. Yeah, Clay's driving the cargo van. That, <laughs> does, that's does it have windows? As long as it has windows, I'm fine. Or it, please don't tell me I have the windowless van. Uh, well, you know, it, it, it's really a personal preference at that point. You can choose to have windows or not if you want. The the requirement is that it does say free candy on the side, so you really got to paint that off, Clay. It's a little creepy. And play creepy music while you're driving around. As long as it doesn't say, you know, come pet my puppy dogs, and I guess it's uh, I'll, I'll settle for free candy. I guess it could be worse. That's true. That's true. But yeah, in, in terms of that, you just got to think about what this is almost like the reverse engineering of deciding how many monitors you needed up front. Um, if you think that you're going to be playing video games and stuff like that, you're probably going to look at more of a gaming specific, you know, NVIDIA GTX card versus kind of a workstation card. And, you know, any of any pretty much any gaming video card can totally handle um, the games you're going to throw at it. You know, d the more you spend, the better performance you're going to get. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, regarding trading, just about any of those cards will work absolutely fine. And like Nate said before, too, if you're not going to do any gaming at all and you're just going to use one or two monitors, you can most likely, the, the whole onboard video card stuff is really cool, um, really cool new technology that they started adding because it didn't pretty much exist before uh, I did my last two builds. But um, yeah, it, it, it's a nice feature um, and it kind of can keep your costs down if you're not going to be doing any gaming or anything, you know, visually crazy and, you know, playing 4K movies and stuff like that and using it like that. Awesome, awesome, and that that was beneficial because I could see, I would have never thought, okay, video card, I, I just would assume video card support, whatever, but again, just to reiterate, if you have 4K monitors, make sure your video card can support 4K monitors because I would have, I totally overlooked that because uh, I, I just, I would have incorrectly assumed, obviously, that video card, it is what it is and it would support any kind of monitor, but that, that makes total sense. So, all right, we got our monitors done, Nate. Uh, now, uh, now where are we headed for the build? Uh, we could go anywhere. I usually go to the memory or the RAM next. And basically I just buy whatever the motherboard supports that we picked. So in this case, uh, the motherboard supports DDR4 2800, I think it was. Um, so that's, or 2400. So that's what we picked. We bought uh, 16 gig of DDR4 2400 memory. Um, wasn't really a whole lot that goes into that. I would say if you're buying a, or building a system, you don't want anything less than eight gig of memory, but 16 to 32 gig is probably going to be the most you'll ever need. You're probably never going to need more than that for a, for a typical system. And Chez, why don't you explain to listeners <clears throat> and me, what exactly does memory do again? What is its function within the body of a computer? 
So I guess an analogy to use it as kind of the, the CPU and the processor and the motherboard, those are kind of the brains of the computer. Those are the ones that are, that are going to kind of do the logical thinking for you. Now, the RAM is almost like how good of physical shape are you in? So the more RAM you have, um, the more kind of uh, Chrome tabs or Firefox tabs you can have open. You can do more things at once if you have more RAM. Essentially, every time you open a program or another Windows tab or a Skype uh, you know, Skype program. Any the more programs you open, the more of this RAM, this memory it's using. Um, so I totally agree with Nate. Especially if you're only going to be doing trading, you're absolutely fine doing only uh, eight gigs. This is another one of those realms where you don't have to go and fully max out your motherboard to start. This is something that's totally easy to upgrade. Um, the one I, I only have 16 gigs of RAM. Um, my old build actually had 32, um, but it really wasn't being utilized. I didn't need it, so I only went. I have still have more slots. I can double my RAM to from 16 to 32 if I want to. Um, but honestly, I've never even come close to kind of maxing that out with three trading platforms open, running. Uh, gosh, I have so many Chrome tabs open just for work and everything else um, that I've never even come close to using uh, all of them. I usually use maybe at the most eight. So um, unless you're doing some crazy multitasking, video editing, and all this other kind of stuff that's really kind of intensive, um, I'd say eight to 16 is totally safe. Now there is one thing I want to say if you are going to upgrade your RAM in the future. Mixing and matching RAM from different brands and stuff like that you can have some problems with it. For the most part, you want to get the same exact brand, same model number of your RAM if you're going to be adding more in the future. Um, compatibility and stuff like that, for the most part, they're meant to work together, but some chip processors are just slightly different than other ones. It might cause your computer to lock up or crash more often. Um, I only had to learn that lesson once, about two builds ago, um, and now I always will just buy the same brand, same model, same everything, keep everything in line, and then I haven't had any issues. Any comments on there, Nate, or is it a pretty good summary? No, I totally agree. Um, I've done that a lot where you have to upgrade memory, and yeah, I always buy the same model, name brand, everything. Even if I have to buy it used, I'll pick a used stick over a used stick of the same model over a new stick that doesn't match. So make sure these model numbers match. That's kind of the, the hardcore bottom line here. Yeah, if you're going to upgrade down the road, make sure you get more of the exact same what you had currently. And is that... Uh, insulation wise that's that's pretty straightforward right you literally just plug these thing you know plug it in the motherboard or whatever I mean it's that's not like you need a hammer and nail or anything right nope no tools required they're simply just slide them in there thumbs. and they lock in yeah there you go so that assumes you have two thumbs so but so if, you as could long use as you have index two thumbs, fingers if you you could use one thumb if you wanted or a palm or your forehead if you want but yeah for the most part two thumbs is pretty safe if you don't have two thumbs I'm sure we could figure out a way around it Nice, nice. Okay, so now where do we have to head, Nate? I'm, I'm losing track of what we, where we've been and where we still need to go. So th the show is yours. We're getting close. We're getting close to the end. Uh, the next place we need is the hard drive. So like the memory is the temporary storage while you're using stuff. The hard drive is a long-term memory that's going to store everything forever until you delete it. Um, in this build, we decided to go with uh, M.2 drive. Uh, they're basically like a PCIe connection, and they're super fast and super tiny. Uh, they are a little bit more expensive, but opening up Windows and software and that stuff like that is going to open up almost instantly with a drive like this because they're so fast. Uh, so we went with a 512 gig uh, Samsung 960 Pro card uh, if you want to look those up but you could totally go with a, a standard ssd that's going to connect via sata um, or if you're not caring about speed at all you could go with an old school like platter side type hard drive uh, they're slow but they're cheap and they are huge so so when you say opening up windows is that like when i boot up my computer how fast windows you know pops up to allow me to to type in my password and all that yeah, how quickly Windows boots up, how quickly your programs open up, uh, that type of stuff. Okay, yeah, I would definitely say I've seen a big difference in that because my old one, I mean, it's not that it was slow, but Windows waiting for everything to you know boot up and get going after I type in my password to even log into Windows. It seems to be a whole lot faster now, so that's what you're talking about when it comes to hard drive. Yeah, exactly. You had a standard SSD that was connected via SATA before, and just the throughput and the speed of this new one is light years ahead of what your other one was. Yeah, I have no idea what you just said. That was Chinese, which again, for you listeners out there, this is why 
on the show notes page, we will have links to all this stuff because I Nate could have just cussed at me for all I know, and I don't even know what he just said. Something about SSDs and SARS and I don't know. It sounded like an STD, but anyway, so uh, Chez, when it comes to, uh, I mean, what do you have as far as uh, the hard drives and all this? Again, keep in mind, listeners, he is talking about more so from a gaming perspective and gaming slash trading perspective. So, I mean, Nate really nailed it um, for to keep it in real simple terms. Um, the hard drive you have it almost is like a, a really fast delivery. So, say you order food and like Jimmy John's can deliver it in five minutes or you try to order uh, an Italian dinner that might take, you know, 45 minutes. Um, what you got is the Jimmy John's. You got the very fast delivery. Everything will open up very fast. Um, and the one recommendation I do have, and, and Nate pretty much summed it up, they do make, you know, a traditional hard drive is pretty much actually disk spinning. Um, they're noisier and they're drastically slower. Um, and here's the, the thing about that. While you can save some money getting a regular hard drive and it'll totally be sufficient, um, I have actually had issues where those hard drives have actually crashed before. Um, as far as kind of wear and tear, since they're actually a physical object moving around, spinning, there's a little needle. It almost looks like a little record player with a bunch of records on it. Um, they're more prone to have issues. If you bumped your tower the wrong way um, or any kind of stuff like that, you could possibly crash your entire hard disk. So I would recommend, especially with the way prices have gone now, you should be looking at getting a solid state drive or an SSD. Um, so I personally, I have a, I don't have any M.2 cards because those are kind of a newer thing. Um, will I get them in the future? Absolutely. Um, I really do value the speed at which things kind of open up and I don't like sitting around waiting with the window spinning wheel and stuff like that. Uh, we've gone too far in technology to kind of have to even deal with that now. So um, even if you get a regular SSD, you're already a leg ahead of the game. I've had one SSD that I've owned for nine years now. Still runs fine. I have it actually on my PC in the living room. Um, still operates totally fine after nine years. So um, with other hard drives, I mean, they just start getting uh, messed up. They'll start making noises. So I, I would never dream of even having a hard drive. Um, none of mine ever lasted, you know, more than uh, six, seven years. I was uh, obviously I used them very heavily, but um, still another thing you got to keep in mind is um, as far as kind of the space. So I think Clay, you have a 500 gig one. Um, if you are downloading, if you are a photographer and you have gigs and gigs and gigs of photos and stuff like that, you're going to need to be aware of the size you get. So I have a one terabyte drive, which handles all of one terabyte SSD that handles all of my, um, I used to be into photography videos. I have a ton of that stuff on there. Then I have a 256 uh, gig hard drive that just houses my game. So they load very fast. And then I have a 128 gig um, solid state drive that just handles my operating system. So I kind of keep them all separated. Um, the reason I do that is because when I change builds, I can literally just take out this drive, my, my drive that has all my videos and photos on it and plug it into the new computer. And it'll work just like, a, almost like if you plug in a USB stick, it pretty much works as simple as that um, for when I do upgrade PCs. And I do like my computers. So I do upgrade things. I do new builds every Every couple of years. Um, so that's the only reason why I do that. You absolutely do not need three different drives for things. Um, but just be aware, this is almost like, you know, the monitors and everything else kind of looking ahead. If you know you're going to be using a lot of stuff, if you download movies or whatever it is, um, you're going to need to get a little bit of more space than, um, say, a, a 256 or a 128. Now, and along with a comment can... a little bit earlier back, Chaz, which, I, which is a great point about pricing and, you know, how pricing has basically improved. So, for, for what you're saying is maybe an older hard drive, but still an SSD, uh, what, what sort of price uh, you know, are you looking at, um, which like you said, would still be more than enough and would be much better than you know, these older school ones. So what sort of price, how, how friendly has pricing become in terms of still getting a good quality, uh, you know, kind of minimum hard drive to get for at least trading? Um, well, memory now has, it, it really kind of depends on, or just kind of your, uh, how much storage and stuff like that. Those, those prices have dropped. I actually haven't been in the market for quite some time. I don't know if Nate, you want to weigh in, but SSD prices in general, they used to be, you know, 500 bucks for a very small one. And nowadays I feel like it's less than half that. Um, you know, there's no, in my opinion, there's no reason not to spring for an SSD, uh, versus a regular hard drive. The price is just slightly more. And in my opinion, they just are so much faster. And, um, in my opinion, last longer, but as far as pricing and stuff like that, uh, I have no idea actually where the price pricing has been. I haven't had to, to look up any of that stuff in about two years now. 
So for so basically, we're talking about three types of hard drives here. We're talking about the M.2 drives, which are like the newest, latest, and greatest. Then we're talking about standard SSDs, and we're talking like the old school platter spinning hard drives. So price wise, the M.2 drives are the most expensive. They're the most fa- they're the fastest. For one terabyte of that, you're looking at about five hundred and eighty dollars. Uh, for a one terabyte standard SSD, which would be right in the middle in terms of speed um, and reliability, you're looking at like three hundred dollars. For one terabyte of the old school splitting tr- platter drives, you're looking at like forty dollars so you get a lot more speed <laughs> but, but the forty dollars a lot but because i'm sitting here my eyes lit up but then i remember what Chez said that's like Chez, correct me if i'm wrong if i misunderstood you but that's like a headache waiting to happen right yeah it's just in my opinion don't get me wrong i think it's awesome that you can get one terabyte of storage for forty dollars but for me just and then this is just speaking from experience i've been you know messing with computers for over 15 years of my life um Hard drives, typical old school platter drives are more susceptible to issues. And, you know, um, PC Part Picker, actually, you can kind of compare different drives and it'll actually give you a price per gigabyte kind of comparison. So pretty much that $40 drive is four cents a gig, which is absolutely dirt cheap. And then a regular, you know, solid state drive is like 33 cents a gig. In my opinion, it's totally worth it to know something will work for a long time without issue. Um, I, I, it's just, if you needed to cut some corners in terms of your costs, you could survive on a regular platter drive. It is going to be slower though. And in my opinion, I've just had more problems for like the long term. If you're just, if you're planning on upgrading your computer every two years or something, you could probably get away with it. But remember the speed is the big thing. SSDs are just a bunch of times faster. And the M.2 is even ridiculously faster than that. And I actually run a hybrid of the two in my system. So I have a standard SSD that my operating system and all my programs are on, but I still have an old spinning platter hard drive to store all my videos on because we shoot massive amounts of data and videos, and it's just not cost effective to have a four or five terabyte SSD drive, whereas I can get a four or five terabyte spinning platter drive for less than $100. So that would, but that's definitely on the business side of things, unless people are into shooting massive YouTube videos, yeah, right? Yeah, for the most part, homeowners are never going to need that much space, but that might be a way to lower your cost of entry. Maybe only buy a 128 gig SSD and then get a cheap one or two terabyte big drive if you have other stuff you want to store. Yep, I completely agree with that, and that's actually what I did in my my older builds. You just put your operating system and any of the programs you run daily on the solid state, and they'll load up really fast, and then you can use an older type drive for kind of storage of uh, photos, videos, or anything like that. I'm learning something. This is this is interesting. I'm, I, I, yeah, this is good stuff, but uh, where are we headed next, Nate? Looking at the time, I, and you thought we weren't going to have anything to talk about, Nate. And we're, we're already pushing the, the hour mark, but uh, we are where are we going to need mark. to go next? So really, there's not a whole lot left to do. At this point, you need to pick your case, which that's personal preference. If you bought a micro, UX, micro ATX, well, I can't even think what they're called, micro ATX uh, motherboard, then get in a micro ATX case. If you bought an ATX case, get an a- your motherboard, get an ATX case. It really doesn't matter. You can just pick whichever one you like, which one looks the prettiest. I typically go with the Antec uh, cases. They're fairly well built and they're cheap. So really it doesn't need to do anything. It just needs to hold all my components together. So that's what I go with. Um, in terms of powering the whole thing, you're obviously going to need a power supply. So for a basic system like we built for Clays, there's not any crazy video cards. There's not running 500 different hard drives or anything like that. You just need a basic four or 500 watt power supply nothing special. Uh, sometimes if you start doing two or three video cards in a system, you may need to get something a little more specific. That's going to have all the connections that you're going to need. But for the most part, uh, four or 500 watt basic, um, power supply is going to do what you need to do for it. What about cooling? Don't I have like a, do I have a fan or how does this thing stay cool? Uh, for the most part, you all the fans come with all the parts we've bought so far. So the power supply has got a big old fan in it. Uh, your case is going to have one to three or four fans, depending on what case you buy. And your processor is typically going to come with a fan or a heat sink as well. Um, the one that we bought didn't, so we had to buy a separate heat sink and fan, but that's pretty straightforward. And a lot of them do come with those already. So you just bolt them on and you're good to go. So is, is it safe to say that that Chez, I'm, and I'm asking you this, essentially what Nate just covered these three different areas, is this all basically just, I don't wanna say it doesn't matter because it does matter, but as long as, you know, for example, power supply, it's giving you 400 watts, you know, 400 watts from AMD and 400 watts from NVIDIA, I mean, it's the same, it's 400 watts. Is it pretty much just 
totally personal preference at this point for this, you know, kind of area of the of the build that Nate just talked about? Yeah. So, I mean, there are um, different kind of brands and stuff like that. But for the most part, you know, when you buy a case, it's already going to come with fans. They usually give you their spaces on mine. I can add, I think, three or four fans to mine. Um, I've never found the need to because it vents just fine. Um, and then when you buy a processor, usually they'll come with a heat sink. They don't always like yours specifically. Um, you know, for me, I have more of a hobbyist build, so I have liquid cooling, um, which just so if I want to overclock it, it'll reduce the heat much better than a regular fan Um, but like I said this is more the hobbyist type route Um, and as far as kind of power supplies though the bigger thing you're looking at is making sure you have enough to power everything you have Um, so for me uh, you know while a 400 watt power supply worked for you I had two video cards and like six hard drives in my computer I haven't I had an 800 watt one I still have that I've just been reusing it um And that's just going to kind of come down to what are you, you know, what's the computer really for? If you're not planning on doing a bunch of gaming and adding video cards and a bunch of different stuff like that, you're absolutely totally fine just getting whatever pretty much, I wouldn't say the minimum, but somewhere just above the minimum of whatever kind of power you need and it'll be fine. Those are, um, for the most part, they're relatively the same. They have like bronze ratings and silver ratings and gold ratings and platinum ratings and all that really means is how energy efficient is it? Um, To be honest with you, you don't need to buy the most expensive power supply. Um, Just pick one of the big brands, uh, make sure it has enough kind of wattage for you and in terms of your build and you're pretty much good to go. There's there's nothing too fancy. There's no real kind of uh, big perks or draws compared to from one to the other. Very nice. And I just saw your message in the chat. That's actually a good point. Operating systems. uh, Nate, What did you choose? And then Chez, you piggyback off it and just talk about from a trading perspective, does an operating system, how much does it actually matter for trading? So Nate, you're up first. Uh, So for operating system, we went with a Microsoft Windows 10 Pro 64-bit, nothing fancy, nothing exciting. Um, The only thing to note is you do want to go 64-bit if you're building a new system. I don't even know if you can buy a 32-bit operating system anymore, but uh, the 64-bit will let you use more of your memory as the 32-bit is going to be limited to uh, less RAM. Yep, so I also have Windows 10 Pro, and um, I've come from, I don't know, I've used almost every Windows brand under the the face of the sun. Um, Windows 10, 64-bit, like Nate said, because it's just, like you said, I don't even think they make 32-bit platforms anymore. 64-bit can just do more. It's faster and it's better. It's pretty much the standard nowadays, which is totally fine for you. Um, When Windows 10 came out, when any new operating system generally comes out, Um, there's going to be kind of some hiccups and things that have to kind of get smoothed out over time. Uh, When Windows 10 10 came out, most things worked absolutely fine. There was some issues, but they've done updates. Um, It's been around now for some time. I don't think there's any reason not to kind of go with Windows 10 at this point. Um, Some people always try to stay like one operating system behind. Um, In my opinion, it's not the best anymore because I'm getting, you know, updates from Windows as they fix things, as they resolve issues that, you know, may have come up when they built the thing. Um, So I always recommend sticking to the latest. I'm not saying do like beta testing for Windows 15 or whatever comes out next, Um, but whatever the stable one is out that's currently there, it's supported, um, just do yourself that. And and don't be one of those people that tries to kind of pirate an operating system from like a torrent or somewhere on the internet. Um, I promise you Windows is smarter than that. More likely than not, you're probably downloading a virus that's going to log your passwords and all this other stuff. So do yourself a favor, go buy Windows, an actual copy of it. You can get just the the key and install it from a USB drive or if you have an internet connection um, or you could use a CD, whatever, you know, whatever it comes with. Just buy yourself a genuine one though. Don't don't be one of those people trying to save, you know, 30 to 50 bucks um, by trying to download it and, and then all your banking information information gets stolen and you wonder what happened. Yeah, well, what happened is some Nigerian prince is riding off into the sunset uh, with, with some good cash. Now, uh, I, I guess whoever wants to weigh in on this, but I, I've seen this question, hey, I wanna use a MacBook or I wanna use, basically I wanna use an Apple product for trading. That operating system works perfectly fine too, right? That works perfectly fine provided your platform has a version of their software that works on it. Yeah, so for context here, Thinkorswim actually has a platform for both Windows and for Apple. Um, Not all platforms, though, offer Apple stuff. And keep in mind, if you are listening to this podcast, more often than not, you're building a Windows computer. Um, Apple computers, you can't really customize. You pretty much buy them how they are. 
I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Apple. I, I have an Apple laptop, but um, as far as for trading and just compatibility for especially trading specific things, I would always recommend going Windows over Apple. Um, at the same time, I just I think Linux Linux is really cool, but it's not the most user friendly if you're not like a big tech guy. Um, so I would say stick to Windows. It's your safe bet. Um, pretty much everything that's ever built nowadays, especially for trading related platforms and trading, um, is really built with Windows in mind. So in my opinion, I would stick to that. If you do have an Apple computer though, or an Apple laptop, um, some brokers do have Apple specific kind of programs. But remember, not all of them do. Um, it's not it's not the biggest market in terms of uh, user for trading. That's actually, that's very interesting. I, I didn't think about that. So um, just to make sure I understand, uh, you're not saying Apple's a piece of junk because of their products. You're just saying that as far as trading end, meaning brokers, platforms, tools, for their little software engineers that are typing things up, those codes, those software programs, it, it's almost a guarantee that they're gonna have a version for Windows, but it's not quite a guarantee that they're gonna have a version for Apple. So the risk comes in, you may not have as much flexibility for platforms and tools if you're using an Apple. Is that what you're basically just said? Yeah, yeah. You're, you're pretty much your safe bet is always going to be Windows. That's where they're focusing their time and their effort on. Um, a lot of times people will offer an Apple product after the fact, um, and you don't want to have to get something that kind of emulates Windows on your your Apple computer just to run. And, and just for example, you know, maybe brokers like Schwab or some other kind of large banking type ones, they don't really have a focus on offering platforms to a bunch of people. Windows is their main market. Um, that's why I always tell people for trading, you're going to want to stick with kind of a Windows computer or laptop just because that's what um, their coders, their designers, their engineers have kind of planned for and that's kind of their focus. Super you know, super interesting point. So uh, I th have we covered everything, Nate, or is there any other components uh, that uh, we need to go over quick? I think that's all the parts you need to build a computer. Uh, there's okay. not really, I mean, you can buy more stuff if you want, but not necessary. Okay, I'd say so one thing though, this is important, Clay, because I know you have one as well. Um, it's not required by any means, but I think it's it's pretty helpful for traders. Um, it's called an uninterruptible power supply or a UPS. Um, what that means is that if your power goes out, um, it's almost like a battery banked. It looks like a power strip, but it pretty much has a big battery in it. So if your power goes out, if there's a surge of some kind or something, um, your computer will still stay powered on. Um, me personally, I have uh, two of my monitors plugged into it, my computer plugged into it, and my router and my modem. So essentially, if the power goes out in my complex, and you know, say the internet still works, because usually that's unaffected by you know a power outage, um, I still have the ability to close my trades, um, close out of my computer without having it just hard shut off. Um, and I, in my opinion, it's just, it's a nice kind of almost fail safe so that I'm not, I might be in the middle of managing a trade. And if you're a day trader, this is absolutely imperative. Um, you might be just trying to scalp and say you couldn't get your exit order in and the power goes off. Oh crap, you better get on the phone. You better hope you get to your broker really fast and tell them, you know, cause for all you know, the, the trade is going against you. Um, so I know you have a UPS, I believe you do. Um, they're really not that expensive these days, but like, like we're saying, it's not necessary, but in my opinion, it's a very good thing to kind of invest in, um, just for peace of mind, uh, especially, you know, if you're trading and need to kind of close things out and not, you know, leave anything out to the wind and hope you don't get, uh, you know, blow your account up. I will have to politely disagree with you there. That if if anything we've talked about, well maybe not. I would say the power supply chess. Thank you. I don't shame on me. I didn't even think about bringing that up, but uh yeah, that what he is talking about in my opinion, it is a must have. If you are serious about trading, cuz remember trading is a business. It's not, you know, I want to do it as a hobby. Well, then you're just going to go donate your money to a charity. You got to treat it seriously. And part of treating a trading uh seriously is treated like a business. And part of a business are these things called insurance policies. And that is exactly what Ches just, just, just described. It is an insurance policy. If you are trading, all it takes is one power outage and so, it's just it's just not worth it. And like Ches said, for the price, just it's a one-time payment. It's not like car insurance or home insurance. We have to pay insurance every single month. It's a one-time payment and it's give, gonna give you that insurance policy that if something crazy happens, you're gonna have, I think I have about 20 minutes uh, a power left where I can, you know, close out trades or just do what I need to do, um, you know, in in the freak accident because uh, it's just it's so not worth it. And well, I live in a place where it never ever thunderstorms. There's never any high winds. Well, you know what? 
I've had a couple times here where it is a beautiful weather outside and the power is all of a sudden gone out. So freak things happen. And uh, yeah, Chaz, excellent point. Um, but I would say that is a must have. Um, Cause it's kind of one of those things uh, where if you don't have it, and I could be wrong in my assumption, but right as ah, they're not that serious. They're not here to play ball. They're not here to, to really take trading by the, by the horns. Because if you are, then that's something that's a, a no brainer from an insurance policy perspective. Cause again, it's a one time payment and that payment is not that much. So I use the cyber power looking down at it. Again, we'll put the link in the uh, show notes, but and I've done, actually done an entire video on this where I call it an insurance policy because that is exactly what it was. Wow, Chaz, you opened up a can of worms. I, can of worms, I just ran in on that one. But yeah, that is a, a good point there. And wow, looking at the time, Chaz, you made a statement, so this is totally your fault. I'm not throwing you under the bus, but you made the, the, the statement about kind of cutting corners in a, a, a cost saving type of way. So, uh, and I wanna ask you both this, but is there an area or a couple areas where you would say, if you are gonna cut a little corners, so you, in, in the spirit of saving some cost, you know, where were those areas of the computer build be? So Chez or Nate, you can start off and Chez, you can wrap that up. Uh, I would say, uh, we kind of talked about it a little bit already, but monitors uh, for sure is probably the easiest place to start. Just start with one monitor. Don't buy six of them. Uh, you're going to save yourself a lot of money there. Um, by only going with one monitor, then you can then only, you don't need a video card. So you save yourself a hundred or $200 there. Um, those are probably the best places. And then we also touched on it too with the uh, hard drives. Uh, maybe get a little bit smaller SSD uh, if you don't have quite all the cash uh, or something like that, that'll save you a little bit of money. Yeah, and I was, I was pretty much going to say the same exact thing. Um, if you can keep yourself from having to buy an external video card, you've easily saved yourself 100 or more dollars right there. Um, going with less monitors versus more, you can use the onboard video and um, also hard drives. If, you, if you're just forced to, you can only afford the one terabyte um, you know, platter disk drive for 40 bucks versus you know the $100 SSD, you could do that as well. Um, it'll, it's going to run everything you do just fine. It's, gonna, it's not that it's going to be subpar. It's it's just going to be slower, but it'll totally work. So I would say pretty much um, video card or monitors and pretty much the hard drives. I would not skimp out on the CPU or the RAM or the motherboard. Those things are very important. Um, so if you need to cut costs, cut costs elsewhere. Oh, that's a good point. So would you agree, Nate, that for the non areas where don't even, it's like, you know, the, the big caution tape, do not skimp out here, do not cut corners here. Would you agree with what Chess said in those areas of the computer? Yep, I would 100% agree on that. Thanks, Mr. One Word Answer, but I guess. I, I mean, what else could, do you want it, me to say? I don't know. Just give <laughs> us some Shakespearean type reply that just blows our minds. But I guess, yeah, Ches did summarize that pretty good. So, uh, Ches, Nate, uh, are we missing anything? Do, do we, uh, are, we good, are we good to go? We're good to go on my end. Yeah, I don't have anything else to add. All right, well, that, that, as simple as that. So, um, and I'll wrap it up then. So if you do have questions, if you do have comments or whatever, the best place to really leave those questions uh, so Nate and Chez can see them is gonna be on the show notes page. And again, that is where all these links to these different components are gonna be listed. Uh, so if you do have questions, um, head to the show note page. If you wanna see kind of what these parts look like, like I said, Nate did uh, a, a video that is on our channel, so we'll put that link again in the show notes if you wanna go and actually see Nate build all this together. Uh, but that's gonna be the best place uh, to, to communicate, ask questions, uh, give feedback is right on the show notes page. And if you're there, uh, please click that share button. If you're listening on YouTube, uh, you can definitely you know leave comments there. Uh, but uh, make sure to check out the rest of the channel and hopefully you ultimately decide to subscribe. And then finally, if you are listening on iTunes uh, or any of the other podcast players, uh, please subscribe. And especially on iTunes, uh, a very easy, a very simplistic way to just communicate to, to Ches and I and Nate as a show producer that, hey, you guys are doing great. Please keep making these. Just leave us a ranking or leave us a rating. Uh, that really does help us out and goes a long way. So thank you. Chez, thank you, Nate, for your, uh, uh, your. I, I was gonna say a word, but I don't wanna, I'll say it, for your geekiness. I appreciate your geekiness. It has helped out um, non-geeks like me, although I am a geek, so see, this is why I shouldn't have gone down this. Maybe we'll have to edit this out. No, we won't edit it out. But anyways, thank you to you two. Uh, very fascinating, and I, I learned some things, and hopefully listeners did too. We'll see you back next week. This has been the Stock Trading Reality Podcast. 
Thanks for taking the time to hang out. To learn more about Clay and the Clay Trader community, including the trading team, premium training, and more, visit claytrader.com. <laughs>